It was an impressive string of victories. The young Confederate States of America had already proven itself to be a formidable enemy in its war for independence from the United States of America. In July 1861, amateur armies had clashed on the plains of Northern Virginia at Manassas, and the South had emerged victorious. In the early spring of 1862, Confederate General Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson had dazzled the world with a successful campaign against superior numbers that remains today a model of boldness and daring. A few months later, yet another hero emerged for the new nation. With Union General George B. McClellan's massive army standing at the very gates of Richmond, Robert E. Lee took over for the wounded Joseph Johnston as commander of the army facing McClellan. Though outnumbered two to one, Lee launched a series of costly but effective assaults that drove McClellan back to the mouth of the James River, eliminating the threat to the Confederacy's capital. Completely intimidated by Lee, McClellan refused to renew the drive on Richmond without reinforcements, and President Lincoln grew increasingly impatient. Finally, Lincoln resolved to take matters into his own hands. He reasoned that threatening Richmond from the north, while McClellan remained south and east of the city, would put more pressure on the southern army than it could handle. Lincoln created a new army for this purpose and gave command to General John Pope, a politically powerful man with a record of some minor successes against Confederate strongholds on the Mississippi River. Pope was an unfortunate choice. He greeted his new Eastern army with the statement that in the West, they had always seen the backs of their enemy, insulting the courage of brave men whose only fault lay in the poor quality of their past leadership. Pope also managed to offend the Confederate high command by declaring in effect open season on the personal property of the citizens of Northern Virginia and announcing that he would hang without trial any person found aiding the Southern cause. Such harsh measures were unheard of in 1862 and caused the normally courtly Lee to label Pope a miscreant and state that he should be suppressed. Pope could look for little in the way of help from his new corps commanders, who shared amongst them a rather lackluster reputation in battle with the Confederates. General Irwin McDowell, the victim of the Yankee rout at Manassas a year earlier, would lead the first corps, numbering some 18,500 men. General Nathaniel Banks, one of the several officers defeated by Jackson in the Shenandoah, would head up the second corps, numbering only 8,800 men. General John C. Fremont, who had also been trounced by Jackson in the valley, would command the Third Corps with 12,000 men. Fremont, incensed that Pope, a junior officer, had been promoted over him, resigned in disgust, and another political incompetent, Franz Siegel, took his place. Lee watched this concentration with concern. He had no intention of allowing his newly named Army of Northern Virginia to be attacked from two directions at once. With McClellan apparently immobile at Harrison's Landing, Lee turned his attention to Pope, sending his first team of Jackson and A.P. Hill to keep Pope off balance 
until he could arrive with the rest of his army. Jackson, in overall command, aimed his initial thrust at Banks' small second corps, then in the vicinity of Culpeper, and threatening Gordonsville, an important rail center. With Hill's men, Jackson commanded almost 25,000 veterans, more than enough to crush Banks. As reports of the Confederates' approach came in, Banks sent Sam Crawford's brigade south General to slow Harvard, the advance, like while he brought up the rest of the corps. Yes, sir, General Banks. General Williams, I'd like you to follow. Slaughter Mountain, so as it was then was known, lay six base. miles south of Culpeper and was bordered by a small stream known as Cedar Run, giving the battle its modern name, Cedar Mountain. Union cavalry, under its newly appointed commander, General George Bayard, kept Banks a prey to the Confederates' advance. But Bayard's intelligence was sketchy and incomplete, and Banks had no idea that he was outnumbered almost three to one. Banks soon joined Crawford with the rest of his corps. He now had a total of two full divisions under the command of Alpheus S. Williams and Christopher C. Auger. On August the 9th, he took up position astride the Orange Culpeper Road to block Jackson's advance. His left flank rested on some low hills facing the heights of Slaughter Mountain, with his right shielded by heavy woods. With artillery posted on the nearby hills, Banks waited for the advance elements of Jackson's force to arrive. Stonewall Jackson was, without question, one of the Confederacy's most brilliant officers. But he was not without his faults, and one of them was a frustrating tendency to reveal nothing of his plans to his subordinates, while demanding total and unquestioning obedience to his orders. This closed-mouthed approach to leadership sometimes led to problems on the battlefield, and nowhere was this better demonstrated than at Cedar Mountain. On August the 7th, Jackson issued written orders for the order of march the next day. Ewell's division was to lead off, followed by Hill, followed by Winder's division, which included the Stonewall Brigade, Jackson's original command. At midnight, Jackson changed his mind and sent Ewell by another route. Jackson never notified Hill of this change, and as dawn broke the next day, Hill's men were up and awaiting the passage of Ewell. Hours passed before a brigade appeared. When one finally did, it turned out to be from Winder's division. Unwilling to break into Winder's line of march, Hill elected to wait until he had passed. Through no fault of his own, therefore, Hill was late in starting, and an infuriated Jackson would start the battle with Banks with only half of his command on the field. The dispute over who was responsible would rage until Jackson died at Chancellorsville nine months later. For his part, Banks was eager to redeem himself after his poor showing in the valley. Interpreting his orders liberally, he determined to attack Jackson if the opportunity presented itself. As the Confederates probed within range of the Union artillery, the Federal guns opened up, and the Southern artillery soon responded.
Jackson's men moved into position, shielded from view of the Federals by the rolling hills, and skirmishers moved forward cautiously, looking for the blue-coated infantry they knew were close. Patiently, Banks pushed the divisions of Williams and Augur forward, hoping for a quick victory. The men of Jubal Early's brigade on the Confederate right and Winder's division on the left, the brunt of this assault, and the fight soon became a slugging match between the two sides, taking its toll of the men in the ranks. Confederate General Charles S. Winder, commanding Jackson's former division, posted his men as ordered and began directing the fire of an artillery section posted nearby. The Yankee artillery found the range quickly. A well-placed shot sent a fragment tearing through Winder's body, mortally wounding him. As word was being forwarded to the senior brigade commander, William Tolliver, the division was momentarily leaderless. Follow me! At this critical juncture, two Yankee brigades under Sam Crawford and George H. Gordon suddenly burst from cover and struck the flank of Winder's line without warning. The famous Stonewall Brigade, never defeated in battle, broke and ran into the ferocity of the assault. Fighting suddenly intensified on the Confederate left, Jackson, who had feared just such a reverse, rode to the sound of the guns. Attempting to draw his sword, he found it rusted into its scabbard. Frustrated and faced with potential disaster, he detached the scabbard and, waving the whole arrangement over his head, attempted to rally his men. Crawford, who had been a surgeon at Fort Sumter, pressed his attack vigorously, however, and Jackson's attempt had only limited success. 
if the Confederates were to prevent total defeat, their only hope lay in the arrival of A.P. Hill's men. Hill would not disappoint them. He had donned his red battle shirt that morning, and his men knew they were headed for a scrap. Already, his brigades were beginning to arrive, and he deployed them quickly as they came up the road. First, Thomas was sent to the aid of Early's men on the right, then Branch, Archer, Pender, and the rest of the light division were thrown into line on the left, where Crawford was pressing his success. As Hill's veterans rolled into action, the Confederate line began to stiffen. Crawford's men had done well, but their ranks were depleted, their ammunition nearly exhausted, and the sudden appearance of nearly 12,000 Confederates was more than they could withstand. Reeling under the power of Hill's counterattack, they paid a fearful price. Every regimental officer in Crawford's brigade was shot down. Almost half of his men would never answer another muster call. The Yankee attack dissolved into a run for safety. Banks had committed every reserve to the fight. He had no troops left to counter the fresh brigades of Hill. Exuberantly, the victorious Confederates surged forward, an irresistible wave of steel, smashing the remnants of Crawford's regiment. Gordon's brigade stood alone against the tide, and their valiant resistance could do little more than postpone the inevitable. In gallant desperation, two squadrons of federal cavalry under Major Richard Falls charged the Confederate lines in a vain attempt to slow them down. This assault cost him 93 of his 164 troopers and had only a passing effect on the massive gray formations. Help was on the way in the form of the division of James Ricketts whose artillery battery had suffered so at the first Manassas. 
Ricketts had been ordered south from Culpeper when the fighting had first begun. But he was slow in starting, and the battle had swung so quickly in favor of the Confederates that he failed to arrive in time to affect the outcome. It was the Union artillery and the fall of darkness that ultimately slowed and then stopped the Confederate attack, though the fighting continued well after darkness had covered the land. As the Yankees rallied around Ricketts, Jackson decided to call off any further assaults. Reluctantly, the Southern troops halted and slept on their arms. The agony of the wounded haunted many of the survivors for months afterwards. Banks also lost the services of three generals, two that were wounded, including Christopher Auger, and one captured. For these men, there was nothing minor about Cedar Mountain. And for the men in the ranks, the name Slaughter Mountain now had a grim and poignant irony to it. The battle was also important in terms of the unfortunate feud that emerged between Hill and Jackson. Both were fine officers, and the animosity between them grew to almost tragic proportions. Ironically, Jackson died with Hill's name on his lips, not in anger, but in praise. Both men would emerge as heroes in a war that produced many candidates for the title. Banks' men had proven that the insult implied in Pope's earlier words was unfounded. They had fought bravely and indeed had nearly taken the measure of the famous Stonewall. Boldness and daring were not hallmarks of Banks' career, and his men had much to be proud of that August afternoon. But Banks had been premature in his attacks. Without support and little in the way of real intelligence, his attack was not an example of boldness and daring, but impetuosity. That impetuosity had cost him nearly 25% of his effectives, with little in the way of concrete results. Jackson's tactics have also come under fire. His failure to communicate effectively with his subordinates created confusion on the march and nearly cost him the battle. Faulty disposition of the troops on his left flank had left him vulnerable to Crawford's attack and resulted in the only humiliation the Stonewall Brigade would suffer in its years of otherwise distinguished service. A.P. Hill's timely arrival had saved both the Army and Jackson's reputation. In the weeks that followed, Lee and Pope maneuvered for positions along the Rappahannock. Finally, Lee resorted to his favorite tactic of flanking his opponent and sent Jackson on one of his now legendary marches around Pope's army. Jackson arrived in Manassas Junction, squarely in the rear of the Union army, without Pope's knowledge, and proceeded to loot and destroy the Yankees' principal supply depot. Pope, embarrassed once again, moved quickly to trap Jackson, boasting that he would bag the lot the wily Stonewall deftly sidestepped the blundering braggart, however, and went into hiding until Lee could arrive with Longstreet's corps. Two weeks after the fight at Cedar Mountain, Pope and Jackson tangled on the old Manassas battlefield. For two days, Jackson's outnumbered veterans repulsed Pope's attacks, while Longstreet moved secretly into position on the Yankees' flank. When he finally moved into the fight, Longstreet's legions crushed Pope's divisions in a slashing attack that demolished the 5th New York Zouaves, which took 300 casualties in 20 minutes.
rest of Pope's army was also quickly overwhelmed by the surprise attack and fell back in disorder. Although the Confederate attack was eventually halted, the Union army once again found itself outmaneuvered, outflanked, defeated, and headed back to Washington. Pope was finally finished. Shortly after this second Manassas, he was reassigned to the western frontier to fight Indians, and his influence on military matters was not felt again. The team of Lee, Jackson, and Longstreet had disposed of another of Lincoln's political generals and set the stage for a dramatic change in the character of the war. With little hesitation, Lee set in motion the wheels of invasion. And on September the 1st, 1862, the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia swung into column of march, heading north. It would be the first step in a historic campaign that would lead them to the banks of a lazy stream meandering through Western Maryland, whose name would soon become a synonym for the bloodiest day in American military history, Antietam.